Welcome, everyone, to the Korea Herald Books Podcast. We are your hosts, Beth and Naomi. We are copy editors at the Korea Herald. For regular listeners of the Korea Herald Podcast, this is a special episode in which we have an in-depth conversation about books. We'll provide all the details about the works we discuss in the show notes. Today, we're celebrating a very special month, right, Naomi? Yes, uh, we're recording this in the month of May, which is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, or AAPI Heritage Month. It's an annual celebration in the U.S. that recognizes the contributions and influence of Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans to the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. It's celebrated in May because it commemorates the immigration of the first Japanese people to the U.S. on May 7th, 1843. And in 1992, it was designated as a month-long celebration after it was signed into law. So to commemorate, we wanted to introduce some works of fiction by Asian authors who helped us make sense of our identities and experiences as third culture kids. We each picked three books, and we'd really love to talk about all of our picks, but we'd be here forever, literally. So we'll include a short description of all the books in the show notes, so we hope you can check them out. My picks were, number one, Runaway Diary of a Street Kid by Evelyn Lau, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, and thirdly, Minor Feelings, An Asian American Reckoning by Kathy Park Hong, which I have right here. And this is the book that I'll be focusing on for today's discussion. And how about you, Naomi? I chose Love in a Fallen City by Eileen Chang, The Impossible City, a Hong Kong memoir by Karen Zhang, and Everything I Never Told You by Celeste Ng. The one I wanted to do a deep dive into is Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You. I've actually always wanted to read that book. I even borrowed it from the library once, but didn't have time to finish it. So I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, Well, I think it's actually really timely that you picked Minor Feelings as the book to talk about today, um, because this year's AAPI Heritage Month actually honors the six victims, uh, Mm -hmm. six Asian women that were killed in the Atlanta spa area, Atlanta area spa shootings in 2021. And I read that Kathy, you know, has spoken regularly about the need to um, need for a more collective effort in combating anti-Asian hate crimes and, you know, the need for victims and witnesses stories to be told. That's right. Yeah. Kathy has been very outspoken on the issues of anti-Asian hate, both before and actually after the publication of Minor Feelings in 2020. Um, This book has been very influential in the conversations around uh, Asian American race relations in the United States in the last two years. Um, And this was actually also a Pulitzer Prize finalist and won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. And uh, Kathy Park Hong got on the Times 100 most uh, influential people of 2021 for her writings and advocacy for Asian American women. So she's definitely got the credentials and the reputation to back it, back it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Beth, tell me all about it. Okay, I'd love to. Minor Feelings was published in spring 2020, and it's a collection of seven essays, which, quote, according to the description blends memoir, cultural criticism, and history to expose the truth of racialized consciousness in America. And binding these essays together is her th- Kathy Park Hong's theory of minor feelings, uh, end quote. So when did you read it and why do you think it's relevant now? So I read this book back in 2020 uh, when the pandemic was just starting to unfurl. And at the heart of this book is Kathy's own conceptualization of the contemporary Asian American experience, which, um, as I alluded to earlier, she calls, quote, minor feelings. And um, she cites really strong influences from uh, Claudia Rankin's 2014 Citizen, which is a book length poem uh, and a series of lyric essays about the state of racial relations in the U.S., focusing mostly on black American experiences. And she also credits Sian Nye, an uh, American cultural theorist, literary critic, and feminist scholar, um, and her theory of something called, that Nye called ugly feelings, quote unquote. And um, that being said, what uh, Kathy Park Hong calls minor feelings, how she defines that is, quote, 
Minor feelings occur when American optimism is enforced upon you, which contradicts your own racialized reality, thereby creating a static of cognitive dissonance. You are told things are so much better while you think things are the same. Asian Americans are so successful while you feel like a failure. This optimism sets up false expectations that increase these feelings of dysphoria. End quote. So that's kind of, I would say, a nut, uh, nut graph for what minor feelings is. And um, it just to have one more deeper explanation, um, quote, she says again, minor feelings are also the emotions we are accused of having when we, and when she says we, she's talking about Asian Americans, decide to be difficult, which means when we decide to be honest. When minor feelings are finally externalized, they are interpreted as hostile, ungrateful, jealous, depressing, and belligerent affects ascribed to racialized behavior that whites consider out of line. Our feelings are overreactions because our lived experiences of structural inequality are not commensurate with their diluted reality, end quote. So um, I know that was quite heavy, what I just uh, defined. But in a nut, nutshell, I think those two quotes really sum up what minor feelings are. Um, and Kathy herself, is an Amer- she's a Korean-American poet, writer, and professor who has published three volumes of poetry. And she's a child of Korean immigrants, uh, born in 1976, raised in Los Angeles, California. And she graduated from Oberlin College and has an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which is actually quite a um, very, very, very like highly reputable writing program in the U.S. And she's married and has a daughter who she says was part of the motivation to write this book, which she started writing in 2015. And as to your question about why this is relevant now, she started writing this in 2015. And um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. actually kind of started really gaining steam in 2014, like late 2014, um, with some incidents um, that were made viral on social media. And um, this is really um, Kathy Park Hong's contribution and joining the conversation, the broader conversation on race in America that was sparked at that time and is still ongoing today. I think it was really timely that around the time the book was published, the COVID-19 pandemic was also beginning to spread. And as we know, the first case was reported in the city of Wuhan, China, and was quickly racialized and weaponized by powerful figures, namely then-President Donald Trump, who called it the, quote, Chinese virus, unquote. And so um, in 2021, shortly after the book was published, the Stop Asian Hate campaign um, in the United States started. And similar to Black Lives Matter, Stop Asian Hate is a slogan and the name of a series of demonstrations, protests, rallies against violence targeting Asians and Asian Americans that were held across the U.S. And a Pew Research study from July 2020 found that 58 percent of Asian Americans believe that racist views had increased toward them during the pandemic. Along with this, 45 percent of Asian adults in the U.S. said that they have experienced at least one of five specific offensive incidents since the start of the pandemic. So we can see that there's um, real numbers to back up this um, kind of growing sentiment of fear and um, xenophobia that is growing, at least in the United States. So basically, that's the American context in which Kathy Park Hong's book came into the fray, into the main conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Beth, you're from Canada, and I know this you know, also resonated with you on a personal level because you have you have family in Canada and you you know you spoke um, about concerns you have f- for your family there too. Yeah, that's right. I think that um, because a lot of the attacks are on elderly Asians, at least the ones that are made viral. You know, I'm sure there are many instances of casual microaggressions or racism and you know slurs, but um, the violent attacks have been targeted towards um, elderly Asians. And my mother is in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and she's in her 60s and she lives alone. And I really do worry for her because I do see headlines and reports and things on Twitter and Facebook um, talking about these attacks. And it's it's been really difficult for me. And I do deal with a low grade anxiety about this. And um, Vancouver, I looked into this, has experienced a 717 percent increase in anti-Asian hate crimes 
So mind you, this can be this can seem extreme, but the total number of cases is 98 in 2021 compared to 12 mm-hmm. in 2020. So um, this is apparently more than all U.S. cities combined, um, according to The Guardian, making it the, quote, anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America. This has been um, said by Bloomberg and by The Guardian about Vancouver, which is shocking because I grew up in a mostly in a pretty much like almost 50 percent Asian suburb um, in Metro Vancouver called Coquitlam. And um, I actually never really felt out of place as an Asian, as a person of Asian descent, because I saw so many other Asian kids at school, in high school, elementary school. Um, But I've also noticed that in the last few months, my friend in Vancouver, who's a moderator of several subreddits for cities within the metro Vancouver area, telling me he has to filter out a lot of hateful speech and comments against Asians posted by users. And as we know, Reddit is like the, you know, the real, <laughs> the real jungle. Like it's like where people really say what's on their mind. And I mean, obviously it's, this is an anecdotal um, experience, but it does really concern me because I don't think I've ever heard this kind of stuff before. Um, so that is it for the Canadian context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what aspects of the book Minor Feelings did you connect to the most personally? I think I read it almost in a single sitting, actually, underlining like entire paragraphs and like kind of almost shaking with excitement. It's a sense of like relief and recognition and catharsis that I felt in her words. And what I related to the most was her description of her family dynamics. I also had a very emotionally turbulent household environment due to, um, in part, the trauma of immigration, which um, really seeped into my later years in life. And um, I want to quote actually from an essay called The End of White Innocence, um, the essay that is the most pointedly politicalized, I would say, of hers. Um, and she says, quote, one characteristic of racism is that children are treated like adults and adults are treated like children. Watching a parent being debased like a child is the deepest shame. I cannot count the number of times I have seen my parents condescended to or mocked by white adults. This was so customary that when my mother had any encounter with a white adult, I was always hypervigilant, ready to mediate or pull her away. To grow up Asian in America is to witness the humiliation of authority figures like your parents and to learn not to depend on them. They cannot protect you. So that's really powerful quote for me because... It really encapsulates how I felt growing up. I felt that I had to become an adult very quickly um, because um, as Kathy recounts episodes throughout her childhood in this essay where she undergoes this painful coming of age, this loss of innocence in a country where she has to fend for herself, I recognized myself in a lot of those um, stories and which was surprising because, you know, even though I come from such a cosmopolitan, multicultural city like um, Vancouver, Canada, there were still instances where I really w- found myself nodding with recognition and feeling a lot of um, a lot of relief, actually, that someone could write about these things in this eloquent way. And um, especially with the mom struggling, I, um, I really think that for me, because my mother graduated from an elite women's university in Seoul, she had a very clear identity and sense of her place in the world um, before she came to Canada. And we immigrated here when she was already in her 40s. So, you know, she's she has her worldview that's already set and very shaped by the society here. So um, when we are when I was growing up, I was often the interpreter, um, the medium for my mother in an alien and sometimes hostile environment. And as a result, a lot of the protectiveness and at the same time resentment that Kathy describes when it comes to her parents really spoke to me. And I really connected with that. Mm-hmm. And I think it might um, it might as well for other readers who, you know, haven't read this book yet, but um, maybe um, understand the whole immigration experience and want to uh, process it. Yeah, they might mm-hmm. also find that. Actually, I just want to jump in here today um beth is wearing a ring that was given to her by her mother and i just want to describe it for all of you who are listening on the podcast or um youtube it is her it's a ring from her university 
uh, where she graduated in Seoul, right? Yes. And was there, you know, was there any special reason why you chose to wear it today? Um, I think I kind of wanted my mom to be here with me as I talk about this. Um, and in a way, my mom has completely excommunicated. <laughs> she has excommunicated herself from Korea. She wants nothing to do with this country. Um, and I think that, yeah, her relationship with this country is very complicated. And I wear this ring to keep my connection with the culture and the heritage of my parents while also keeping in mind that um, there's still a lot for me to learn. And I wear this almost to commemorate and to not forget mm -hmm. everything that uh, my mom went through to, to um, get me here, basically, and to move forward with her life. And I think we can get to that in your section, too. When mm -hmm. we you talk about your book, you also talk about how this uh, your book really spoke to your experiences and your relationship with your mother and, and your family. So, um, yeah, that that's the story behind the ring. Thank yeah. you for asking. <laughs> oh. And, you know, we're we're talking about, you know, a lot of heavy topics. But the other aspect I think you wanted to mention was how Kathy really deals with all of this um, pain um, through humor and comedy. And mm -hmm. I think that is something that you wanted to talk about as well, right? Yes, that's right. Um, she really goes into this um, in uh, bad English. Um, she, this is actually one of the essays that I laughed at, like I literally laughed out loud <laughs> at many points because um, she talks about her um, experiences on English.com, <laughs> and uh, which is like a viral meme site back in the day. Um, I don't think it, I don't know if it's there now, but she talks about um, how she, she would basically sh talk, write about examples from the site describing, you know, really bad profanity in the, you know, on children's t-shirts and really bad menus. And I'm sure living in Seoul, we can think of some examples. Um, I've seen some very, um, I don't know, uh, interesting poetry on the walls of Lotteria. <laughs> and also, um, I think I remember seeing radical feminists on like printed on a bag at a subway station next to like glittery phone cases. And it was just hilarious to me. So um, the actual her actual writing itself, b despite the heaviness of the topics, um, it's, it's very tempered with humor. And um, there is actually um, a second essay of the book called Stand Up. And she, Kathy talks about the, quote, shock of recognition that she felt when she first saw Richard Pryor's stand-up act. Richard Pryor is a, a black American stand-up comedian who was actually very influential in her decision to write this work. Um, she, so, she said, quote, in Pryor, I saw someone um, channel what I call minor feelings the racialized range of emotions that are negative, dysphoric, and therefore untelegenic, and um, built from the sediments of everyday racial experience and the irritant of having one's own perception of reality constantly questioned or dismissed. So um, I see this really strong connection between uh, comedy and um, desire to express trauma traumatic experiences or experiences that are very difficult to um, express in a coherent way. Um, and so I was really inspired by her use of humor and her um, release from her own, I guess, state of internalized racism through the stand-up act that she, that she saw. Yeah. And to sum it up, um, what are some of the keywords or phrases that would best capture this book? I would say three uh, main key phrases. Um, the first one would be outsider catharsis. Um, I think anyone who hasn't had an experience of being at the margins, like whether it be because you know, you're queer or a person of color in a majority white society, differently abled or lower socioeconomic class um, than the people around you, I think anybody who has any kind of outsider experience can relate to some of Kathy's experience and her sense of rage and um, inability to express that rage. Um, the second is humor as a path to healing. Um, 
Kathy talks a lot about how, as I mentioned earlier, comedian Richard Pryor's stand-up act helped her process and give shape to her own repressed feelings of helplessness and rage. And she has said in interviews that she originally tried to perform an early version of these ideas she articulated in this work as a stand-up act. So she would ambush her own poetry readings with jokes to her unsuspecting audience, which um, I would have loved to been part of, by the way. But yeah, so that that's very interesting that, you know, she originally, one of the ways she formulated this work was in the form of a stand-up comedy act. So those are my keywords. And um, it's your turn now, Naomi. Can you tell us about your pick for today's book episode? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You, um, and it's her debut novel. It was published in 2014, and the novel is about the Lee family, a mixed-race Chinese-American family of five living in a small town in Ohio in the 1970s. It begins with the middle daughter, Lydia, who has died and her body is found in the middle of the lake, and her death sort of reveals a web of secrets um, of each member in the family, their past, how they struggle to come to terms with this tragedy um, as they try to unravel what has happened to Lydia. And to speak about, you know, what sort of motivated Celeste Ng to write about this um, novel and to explore the themes um, in the book, um, were, she said it was inspired by events that happened in her adolescence growing up in an affluent neighborhood in Cleveland. So um, she talked about how there were three young women from her high school that were murdered um, in different ways. And the horrible tragedy really had an, inf- an effect on her because it was the first experience she had with death and someone dying her age. But you know, more in, more so it made a huge impression on her because um, she had known these people or she thought she had known that the world that they come from. So she had all these questions, you know, such as, you know, were there any things in, in their lives she didn't know about? Or were there any signs or things that, you know, people could have picked up on um, to prevent this tragedy from happening? And she knew their family members, and she was also curious, or she kept thinking about, you know, how these families would have to deal with such a big loss in their lives. So, you know, that's a short summary about what the book is about um, and what were the motivations behind um, Celeste Ng's um, in writing this novel. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I, um, like I said, really wanted to read this book, but just had no time. Um, I saw that she won the Amazon Best Book Award in 2014, um, and this was her debut novel, and she uh, beat out some real heavy hitters for this award, like Stephen King and Hilary Mantel, and that's really impressive. And what is it about Ng's writing style that really stood out for you? It took, uh, so this book took her six years to write, and um You know, it it hooks you from the very first line. If I can just read you what it says, it says, Lydia is dead, but they don't know this yet. And so readers are brought along a mystery of trying to find out what happened to 16-year-old Lydia. Um, But really at the heart of the novel, it's, it's a story about a family and their relationships with each other. And if I could just read um, the description, it is a sensitive family portrait, uncovering the ways in which mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, and husbands and wives struggle all their lives to understand one another. So what really stood out for me is that it's told in an omniscient narrator's point of view. It's jumping from the past to the present, but Celestine does a really good job of trying to interweave how the same events and things Um, that are seen and interpreted from different family members' point of view and how that leads to misunderstandings that have, you know, devastating consequences on each character and, you know, how they act and how they live their lives, basically. And I chose this story because I felt like even though the background and social struggles they dealt with at, at the time is vastly different from my own background, you know, growing up in Hong Kong to a... 
um, Chinese family, I still felt an immediate connection to the story because of the family structure, the dynamics, and just the complex emotions that each family member deals with. And um, it really um, resonated with me and spoke to me on a personal level. But, you know, if I could just give a short background about the family, the Lee family in the book. So it's set in the 1970s in the U.S. and Lydia's mom is white and her dad is Chinese American. And when Lydia's um, parents get married, uh, when Lydia's parents got married, mixed race marriage wasn't even legal in certain states um, in the U.S. So you um, you can imagine how difficult it must have been for a mixed family to fit in in a predominantly white society there. And Lydia has black hair and blue eyes. And she and her older brother are referred to in the story as the only two Orientals in her high school in the paper. So I, I you know, I don't have those experiences. Um, I didn't have those experiences growing up. But I grew up as the youngest kid of a family of five, just like the Lee family. And so I could also identify with their problems and their struggles. You know, the eldest son, you know, having the pressure to want to make something of himself, trying to fit in and trying, you know, the eagerness to please your parents. Um, so, you know, these are some parallels that I, that I saw um, between the novel and my family while reading this novel. Mm, that's really interesting. Let's double click on some of those parallels. So um, what aspects did you feel did you feel the most recognition in terms of parallels um, in the family in the book versus uh, with your own? So like the title of the book says everything I never told you. Um, so it tells readers that is more about the things that were left unsaid than the things that were said. So it really is about a family, supposedly the people who are closest to you and whom you know. But actually, as the story reveals, um, it turns out that they don't really know each other at all. And um, I, know, I, don't, I don't know about you, but in my family, especially in an Asian household, um, my parents seldom talked about themselves and their past and their emotions. Um, and reading the book really made me realize that I didn't know a lot about, you know, the internal struggles of my family, especially, you know, my parents. Um, in Everything I Never Told You, uh, we get a lot of backstory about, about why each family member acts the, w the way that they do. For example, the mother, Marilyn, she's a smart woman who dreams of becoming a doctor, and she scoffs at her own mother's ambitions of being the perfect homemaker. Um, her mom worships, you know, she teaches home economics in school and she, you know, basically worships this Betty Crocker cookbook and in which inside it says, you know, in order to please your man, you have to know how to cook eggs six ways. And in the morning, Marilyn, the mother, she like cooks a hard boiled egg for the eldest son, scrambled and each how they like it. Um, but no, she's really smart. She gets into the women's college at Harvard um, and she's trying to become a doctor, but she eventually has to give it up because she met um, Lydia's father there and she had to raise a family and settle for settle for a suburban life um, there. So, I mean, it really reminded me of my mom reading about this, uh, reading this novel. Um, my mom graduated from one of the top universities in Hong Kong in the 1970s, and um, she was an English teacher, and she married my dad and moved all the way to the U.S. in the 1980s to raise a family. And never in my life has she talked about the sacrifices that she had to must have had to make uprooting her entire life and just moving to the U.S. in the 1980s to raise a family. Um, and, and that really hit me when I read about Lydia's mom. You know, what were my, I, you know, I, I, it, made me que it made me question, you know, what were my mom's ambitions? Um, looking back, did she ever regret the choices that she had to make? And I think as we grow older, um, the more we want to try to understand our parents and the struggle that, you know, they've, gone through to raise us. I think as a kid, we grew up boxed into the mindset thinking that um, our parents' lives began when they became our parents. And we forget that, you know, they had 
an entire life before our existence, and they too had hopes and dreams. You know, if I were to sum up this book for anybody who is interested in reading it, it's a book about family secrets and dealing with grief and the lifelong struggle of trying to understand the people closest to you. And it's a mystery, but it's more than that. It's a powerful dissection of family dynamics um, that incorporates themes of sexism, racism, and intergenerational trauma. And so it's really, reading it, it's subtle and quiet, but it's like peeling away the layers you know, of an onion till you really get to the core of the truth. And um, that was you know, what I took away from reading this book. Wow. Speaking of onions, did you cry? I actually did. Um, you know, reading about Marilyn's mom and the struggles that, you know, her internal psyche, you know, she had all these ambitions, um, but, you know, obviously she has a family to raise. And I and I thought about, you know, you know, my mom, my mom must have had similar thoughts. Um, and I think reading this book really helped me better understand, you know, some of the things that they might have gone through. I think that's a theme that connects both of our picks for today um, about how these works open up questions into our own family histories and our heritage and um, the lived experiences of our parents and the culture that they came from. And through that uh, dialogue and questioning, we can come to a greater understanding and healing of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in that sense, literature is a catalyst for dialogue, right? Or the written word as a catalyst um, is something that I firmly believe in, and I th mm -hmm. and I can and I can you know see that it really moved you as well for mm -hmm. this pick. So yeah. So yeah. If I just if I can just add, you know, everything I never told you. Um, it's about you know so much of the things that were left unsaid and the conversations that we don't have with our parents. And I think, you know, that really struck me and made me want to have those conversations um, with my parents. Um, even though I, I think, I think it, I mean, it will definitely be a hard thing to do because, you know, I don't think, you know, my parents are in their mid sixties and um, they're not the kind of people who are open about their emotions and maybe some of the trauma that they've had to overcome and obstacles that they have had to go through to raise us. And so I think you'll also, I think that's something that you, that you also spoke about and that also resonated with you. I um, still am finding out things that about, about my family that I did not know. Um, and it's always... Um, a discovery, yeah. It's a dis it's a journey of discovery, and fiction is there to help illuminate that journey. So, um, yeah. And you know, we are increasingly seeing more and more of these kind of narratives of the Asian experience in movies and in TV. And minor feelings is being developed into a TV series. Yeah, that's right. And I actually recently read that everything I never told you is also getting adapted for a film. Yeah, I'm super excited for the both of those. And also, you know, one really high profile example is, of course, Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, um, who was actually in town recently for the inauguration of the new South Korean president, um, Yoon Suk Yeol. Oh, you said it. Good. You, <laughs> I've been hearing some reports about how it's difficult for some non-Korean speakers to pronounce his name. Anyways, yeah, r I really wish I could have met uh, Min Jin Lee as well. And we're here, Min Jin, call us, call us anytime. <laughs> um, by the way, what did you think of the first season of um, Apple TV's adaptation of Pachinko? Out of five stars, how many how many stars would you give it? Um, I loved it. I would give it a 4.5 because um, overall I thought it was excellent. How about you? Um, I think it will. I, yeah, I'd also give it a high rating. I, de I definitely felt it had a really um, cinematic quality to it. Um, definitely in like I felt each episode was like watching a feature film like mm, yeah and um it was really moving and i think it was really quite 
a masterful storytelling of, you know, spanning, we're talking about 80 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I really enjoyed it. I docked off 0 0.5 because um, they dedicated one whole episode to Eamon Ho's um, backstory, which I felt was... Um, oh, you mean Hansu? <laughs> yes, Hansu's backstory. Um, not Eamon Ho's backstory, sorry. Um, which, you know, I certainly didn't expect... Um, but I guess, you know, that, you know, it's an adaptation and um, maybe the second season, you know, he'll have a bigger role to play. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, overall the casting was excellent. But yeah, I, I can't help but get distracted every time I see uh, Yi Ho, excuse me, Hans Hu on the screen. <laughs> I kind of half expect him to take out a smartphone and gaze off into the distance. But... <laughs> He's a great actor. No hate here. Um, I'm really looking forward to season two. And I think it's time to wrap up. Um, you can find all the titles we picked and info in the description. Please tweet, message, or email us your top three picks for Asian books you've loved, and we'll share it with our followers. Um, yeah, and thanks so much, Beth, for your discussion um, today on Minor Feelings. I really enjoyed listening to it. And I hope all of you, you know, if you get a chance, try and read it, dig into it. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today for our books podcast. We hope to see you again for our next episode. Thank you. All right, catch you later. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>어 책을 추천하시겠습니까? 어 최근에 웹3 레볼루션이라는 책을 읽었는데 웹3 관련해서 요즘 대기업들도 굉장히 관심이 많고 관련 창업들도 굉장히 많은데 그런 사회 동향을 파악하기 위해서 읽었는데 재밌게 읽었습니다. 저는 요즘 코로나도 있고 해서 여행의 이유라는 책을 추천하고 싶은데요. 어, 여행에 고팠던 사람들한테도 좋고 그리고 현 과거나 미래에 좀 지치거나 걱정되는 사람들이 현재에 집중할 수 있는 책이라서 이 책을 추천할 수 있을 것 같아요. 저는 국제대학원생으로 요즘 Illegal Travelers나 Righteous Dopians라는 실제 어, ethnographers들이 이제 필드워크들을 했던 어, 책들을 바탕으로 네, 그런 논문 결과들을 많이 읽고 있습니다. 제가 추천드리고 싶은 책은 지금 최근에 이제 발매된 이 퇴근한 김에 퇴사까지 라는 책인데 요새 같은 경우는 이제 평생 직장이라는 개념이 붕괴됐잖아요 그리고 많은 요즘 20대나 이제 30대 초반인 분들은 자기 어떤 실력을 이제 증명하고 가치를 높이기 위해서 굉장히 많은 이직과 퇴사를 경험하는 세대라고 볼 수가 있는데 그런 과정에서 모두의 어떤 가치관이나 어떤 식으로 이뤄야 될지에 대한 어떤 불안정성으로 인해서 혼란을 겪게끔 돼요 근데 그럴 때이 책을 읽으면 뭔가 앞으로 어떤 식으로 일을 해야 될지에 대해서 가이드를 좀 잡을 수 있다라는 어떤 교훈이 담겨 있는 책이다라고 할수 있겠습니다. Um, I'm into architecture, so I've been reading Cho Byung Soo's um, Architecture Towards the Earth. Oh, I would recommend Yapu Dano by uh, Kai Peuni because it has a lot of really good motivational poetry in it.